What's up, everyone? So I'm here with Samantha, and she is actually um, an Enneagram profiler. She actually profiled me a few months ago. And what you're going to watch soon is the Enneagram profiling session that we did together, or at least, you know, portions of it. And we wanted to talk a little bit about what Enneagram profiling is and what Samantha pretty much does and like how to pretty much like get into it in a way. And of course, you know, I already knew what, or I was pretty confident in what my Enneagram um, type was, but Samantha, at least during this time when she was doing the sessions and she was still, you know, working for her certification and she was offering free sessions. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? It's an opportunity to continue to be on the other side of the hot seat since I'm always usually profiling other people. Um, and who knows, I might end up with something different, which was interesting because I kind of did it. <laughs> and so I guess we'll probably talk a little bit about that. Um, but yeah, Samantha, I would love for you to any comments, any thoughts that you have <laughs> based off of anything I just said. It's well, thank you. I love talking about the Enneagram and profiling. And it's one of those things that it's a real gift because no one should tell you what your Enneagram type is. You know, that is your own journey of discovery. And so when you're coming from for an Enneagram profiling session, the goal of the conversation is for me to develop a hypothesis of what I'm hearing and to go, right, here's what I'm hearing. This is why here are the observations I've made and what you've said, and then hand that information to you for you to sit down and sit with it and go through it and evaluate it for yourself. So it's one of those really interesting things. No test or even profiler should tell you what your type is, but offer you indications. And when you come for an in-person session versus a test, I can tell you what I'm observing from your, your tone and your energy and your body language, as well as um, how you've answered some of the questions. And I've profiled over 70 people now. And so I've got quite a bit of a database of how different types answer or respond to those questions. So mm -hmm. fascinating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, so when you say, for example, that, okay, we're not supposed to tell you what type that you are, um, somebody probably might think to themselves like, oh, okay, so then what exactly does an Enneagram profiler do? Would you be able to clarify that for somebody who might be listening? Because mm, you might wonder, well, what's, what's the point? What's the point exactly. if you're not going to tell me what my type is? So right. Let me explain the overall process that might help clarify things. So there's three stages to a profiling session and I'm studying or I studied with CP Enneagram through their professional mm -hmm. certification and I use their methodology and it's really robust. It comes with a lot of tools, a set list of questions. And so when you're asking the same questions again and again, you get a lot of data um, that comes through as opposed to mixing the questions up. So three stages are the firstly is an introduction. I let you know what the Enneagram is. I want to know what your goals and what you're interested in. And then I talk to you about this developing hypothesis. Then the second stage, I ask you questions about each of the nine types. And my aim there is to eliminate the types that really don't aren't coming through at all. And mm. by the end of that, I want to have two to three types Sometimes it's more that I'm hearing or I'm hearing enough of that I need to ask more questions about. Yeah. And then the next part is I ask some differentiation questions, either or questions that you might be more likely to see in a test. Um, the first stage is really more open-ended questions. And my, my desire is to probe beneath the surface to find out that deeper motivation. Um, so then I, in the differentiation question, I'm hoping to eliminate one or two of those types. And then I ask you about the subtypes. So for the types that we've got remaining, I ask some very like either or rank these sort of statements to try and figure out which is the subtype I'm hearing the most. Because if I just tell you what I'm hearing in terms of your, the nine types, it isn't a full answer. You really need to explore the subtypes. And that is the instinctual variance of self-preservation, social belonging, and sexual fusion to find out which one of those is strongest for you. Because if I just say, well, I'm hearing four most strongly and here's why, well, that doesn't tell you anything because the three subtypes of four, the self-preservation four, the social four, and the sexual four are all vastly different, as are all of the subtypes. They're all vastly different. And so what I want you to walk away with in this session is the top three subtypes that I'm hearing for you mm. to explore further or the top two subtypes. Now, with some people in their profiling sessions, their top type is really, really obvious, really obvious. And so sometimes I'm like, the type I'm hearing most of, here is a secondary type to look at, um, but 
And the reason I want to always offer you a secondary option is because it's your choice. Mm -hmm. I want you to walk away and compare those two descriptions and go, no, this one is me. This is my core motivation. This is how I act, think, and feel. Um, because if I just give you one, I've taken away your choice. I've taken your ability to decide because it's your core motivation. It's your core wounding. It's, it's what's happening inside of you. I cannot see that. You know, I'm, I'm a seven and um, self-preservation sevens are meant to be very selfish. And at times I really am, but at times I don't see that motivation. I see a motivation of someone who's really bending over backwards to help others. And so it's, I needed to go through and look at those sub, the three seven subtypes for myself, because originally I was mistyped as a sexual seven and yeah. I had to go through and do that analysis. Um, my ego wanted to be a sexual seven. You know, and so if a profiler said to me, you're a sexual seven, I'm like, hooray, hooray, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Great. But if they said, I'd like you to look at the two, you know, self-preservation seven versus sexual seven, I'd be like, okay, I'll go and have a look at those. And if I sat with it and I analyzed it the way I did, I'd have to be honest with myself and go, self-preservation seven really fits. I don't like it, <laughs> but that's the true me. And so I don't want to take sexual away. Sexual seven is choice. second, I'm guessing, right? It is. It is second. Yes. <laughs> I'm yeah. currently exploring why my the, uh, the pain of my social um, being last and um, <laughs> feeling uncomfortable wanting to specialize in groups and stuff. Anyway, that's a side track, but <laughs> I'm going through that at the moment. And so, yes. And so then in the final stage of our, our profiling session, I will explain the top type I'm hearing and why. Here is the way you answered the questions. Here is the body language. Here is the tone. Here are all the things I've observed in you and our time together. And I'll take you through all of that. And then I'll go, right, but here's what I'm also hearing. And often when I take people through those, those top two to three subtypes, they're like, hmm, bits of all of the bits of each of those resonate and for different reasons. And so it gives them the opportunity to walk away um, because I send you a bunch of information later, sometimes too much information. Um, <laughs> and for you to listen to podcasts, watch panel videos, um, read information about each of the types and just see what, you know, sticks out and what resonates with you. Because you actually really need to sit with it for a little while and to start to see what comes up and then see yourself playing it out in the world to really know that this is me because it's hidden from us. Mm. You know, it's a mask and it takes time for us to see that mask. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I had originally mistyped myself as I'm pretty sure most FE users do um, as an Enneagram 2 and then, um, and I was that person who was like saying like, yeah, you know, a lot of FE users mistype themselves, <laughs> mistype themselves as twos, um, but then they have to know about the subtypes. So I thought that I was a social two um, from reading right. uh, Beatrice's book. And then people on Twitter were actually saying like, mm, they were actually comparing me with another um, ENFJ who also identified as a two. And they're like, yeah, no, you're not a two. I think you're more of a three. I was like, a three. <laughs> mm. That was very surprising to me because I was like, people who actually know me, I don't think that they would ever assume that <laughs> in real life. And so I was like, are you guys serious? And it was funny because the other ENFJ that I was being compared to in that sense, like she's way more successful than I am, at least, you know, from what I can see, like way bigger uh, YouTube account, like channel, all of that. Um, more assertive in so many ways. So I was like, if anything, wouldn't I be the two and she would be the three? <laughs> um, but then, um, you know, they, like somebody had brought up like, oh, well, do you disintegrate to eight? And I was like, oh no. <laughs> and I didn't know about disintegrations, I guess, back then. And um, they're like, well, then yeah, then you can't be a two. And I was like, huh, which me going like, oh no, like so this really says a lot about my actual type. <laughs> um, so I actually started like looking into Enneagram three, because, you know, I'm always trying to be honest with myself. And I was like, okay, mm. I can see how I can maybe look like a three a lot of times, but this doesn't fit my internal core, you know? Mm. And then it wasn't until I was like actually profiled by someone else like years ago um, that she was like, mm, you're not a two or a three, you're a nine. And I literally like in the audio, you hear me go, huh. And I'd never <laughs> considered nine for myself. <laughs> And then, then I learned about the, uh, I never looked at the subtypes for nine, but when I looked at the social nine, mm. that I always say the social nine fits like 150% for me, 
Whereas like the sexual nine fits a hundred percent for me. So it's like, I kind of have like a similar thing with you. It's like, okay, sexual nine is definitely me, but it's, it's also like my second instinct. Yeah. But like first instincts, like when I look at social nine, it's like, yeah, that's, that like hurt, that hit me more than <laughs> the two. I was like, oh, you know, I must just be a really healthy two. <laughs> when I learned about social nine, I was like, wow, I'm kind of, I was like, I'm kind of pathetic. <laughs> stuck in my patent. Just stuck yeah. in my patent. Exactly. Um, mm. But then, you know, the profiler said that, but it's good that people are actually seeing you as a three because that's your growth point. I'm like, oh, so yeah, that was like really interesting for me to like, you know, come to and that's helped me a lot, like, you know, with my mm. own development and everything. Um, and so in this session, as I said, guys, uh, it's going to be interesting, you know, because I was still answering, honestly, you know, I wasn't trying to like figure it out, like, okay, what would a nine say in this? You know, I wanted to see like what it would actually be. Um, and I think, Samantha, you said that you already knew what my subtype and everything was. I had, too, I had watched a video of you uh, mm -hmm. talking. So, but I, again, I tried to set all of that aside because people right. will come to you having, you know, gone, taken tests before or being stuck between two types. And while I ask them not to share that up front, sometimes that happens. And yeah, I have to yeah, be able to sure. set that aside to look at everything sort of objectively as possible. Same it's interesting. profile sessions. So I yes. get that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nines often mistype as or show up as um, twos and sevens, particularly social nines, because they're so outgoing and, and friendly mm -hmm. and busy and, and helpful. And there's all that sort of stuff going on. Um, and as you see, when you watch this video, those are the three types that we were looking at um, mm -hmm. by the end of the session that we we're trying to like uh, work down from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And then um, I think that it was just really interesting. The uh, result that you also gave to me, even though, you know, at the end we were like, yeah, I don't think this is your probably like actual type, but I was still like open to like, you know, learning about it and exploring it. Um, and yeah, I just think that this was an interesting session. Um, if anything, at most it, I like when somebody else can ask me questions that maybe I don't ask myself. So mm. if you no, know, you might even already know what your Enneagram type is, you know, you when in a moment we're going to have Samantha like you know drop her information so that you can get an Enneagram profiling session with her but like if you even already know what your Enneagram type is and everything then you know you should still maybe hit up Samantha because you never know like a lot of these questions like it might probe you in a way to be able to like be like oh yeah you know I hadn't thought of that for myself before and kind of like just find a different way to like you know connect mm. with yourself on a deeper level um, and that's pretty much like what helped me I think that that's usually like what I'm like searching for. And if you do not know what the Enneagram is, I have a video on um, what the Enneagram is, like a brief but not so brief intro to the Enneagram, as well as also a whole other video on what the subtypes are. I have a 30 minute video of that. And then I have a condensed like eight minute version video for those who have lower attention spans. <laughs> but um, before we proceed, uh, Samantha, where can people find you if they would like an Enneagram session? Uh, well, I will include a link in the description, but you can find me at individuo.co.nz. So that's I-N-D-I-V-I-D-U-O. It's like individual, but with the duo at the end, because we do all things alone together. You know, that's sort of how our self-development journeys go. So Beautiful. Um, so you're about to see a recording of our interview, and it starts at my questions for type eight. And then it goes all the way through the differentiation questions and into the explanation. And the explanation is a little bit different than I would do for people who sort of didn't know their type up front, because um, I would normally explain the Enneagram a lot more, but I skipped over all of that because you um, obviously know the Enneagram quite well. So mm -hmm. it's not quite what people would normally um, experience um, in the recording, but yeah, I think it's still a great example of a profiling session. Totally agree. So on that note, y'all enjoy. Okay, how easy or hard is it for you to say what's on your mind? Right now in life, I'd say that it's it's pretty easy. Mm -hmm. I think that I I think actually actually yeah, I'd say that it's always been pretty easy. It's been very easy for me to articulate the things that I think about. Mm -hmm. So yeah. you that's always been true for you so going back to your sort of teens and 20s yeah 
Yeah, okay. that's what I've been told. Yeah, like mm-hmm. uh, my parents, like, I think that's actually a big, what's the word, trademark, maybe, for lack of better terms. My parents have always said that uh, ever since I was a kid, then the teachers would always be like, wow, like Denzel speaks so well. He's so articulate. He's so this. So yeah, I, I don't think that's that's ever been a problem. Okay. And how easy or difficult is it for you to move toward a confrontational situation? Mm. <laughs> uh, that That's pretty difficult. I, I yeah. My, the biggest thing for me is I'm, I, I don't like to say I'm conflict avoidant. I like to say I'm unnecessary conflict avoidant. Uh-huh. But my wife pointed out to me uh, shortly after that saying some, a, a conflict is unnecessary is very subjective. So, oh. like, yeah, so I was like, oh, I guess I hadn't thought about that. Like, of course, I'd say unnecessary conflict, but that's what probably any conflict avoidant person might say. So, yeah. So yeah, it's all that to say, like, yeah, no, I'm not, I'm not very okay. good with that. But when I do approach it, then I, I, I'm very meticulous and ready to, yeah. Um, when you're working with others to get something done, do you like to be the boss or would you rather not be in charge? It depends on what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, if I'm afraid to be in charge a lot of the time because I'm afraid that I'm either too incompetent to be the boss and then that's just a lot of responsibility on me or that other people in the group might be secretly thinking like well it kind of goes back to what I just said but yeah like like oh what is he doing stuff like that but if I'm voted to be the boss and I don't feel like other people are looking at me like, oh, I could have done a better job, then I'm actually very comfortable with it because uh-huh. then it's like, okay, worst case scenario, they're the ones who voted for me. So it's not like I'm going to, you know, jump and be like, okay, I'm, I'm in charge. Like, I, I don't see myself in that way. Um, and if somebody else is more capable, then I'm more than happy to let them do it. Okay. And do you find yourself um, sort of nominated or put forward for leadership roles regularly? Yeah. Do you tend to be excessive in the things that you do? Excessive in the things that I do. All right, I'm trying to analyze that word excessive. I guess... Would you say like, so when it, the things that I do, do I do them a lot? Like whether it's playing video games or working or is that what you mean? I'm not allowed to interpret. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, I'd say, yeah. If I, if I like the video game that I'm playing at the time, then I can really play that video game for a long time. Um, if I like a certain food then I can really keep on eating that food a lot um yeah if I if I discover a new topic a new artist even like a Mm -hmm. music artist or something I dive deep into that so yeah okay and how attuned are you to unfairness or injustice I really dislike unfairness and injustice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, 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 I disdain it. Um, but I, I'm very, I also consider myself to be more on the merciful side as opposed to justice side. So I think of myself as admittedly naive that if I communicate to this person or if if the person is sorrowful, then they can have a change of heart. Like I'm always having room in my mind for the person to have a change of heart. But mm-hmm. yeah, if, if there's not a change of heart, even remotely possible there, then I can become very impatient with such a thing and very infuriated by it. 
Thank you. And how easy or difficult is it for you to be vulnerable or show weakness? I think it's pretty easy for me to show vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Weakness. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I mean, yeah, yeah, I think I think I'd say yeah, I think it's it's pretty easy for me to show weakness to depending on how it's defined. Like I, I, I pride myself in having no problem in apologizing mm -hmm. um, when and owning up to things when I've done wrong, because I'd much rather just say, hey, I'm sorry that I did this or whatever. I wasn't thinking straight, blah, 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 and make sure that there's peace between us then to hold on to my pride and uh keep some kind of like static between us in that way um mm -hmm. but uh and I'm I also don't have much of a problem saying like oh actually I don't know this so can you please educate me but I really don't like admitting that weakness before people who are like huh, you didn't know that like are you serious like they kind of like rub it in in a way that mm -hmm. makes me feel very uncomfortable. So in those situations, I, I really try to avoid showing my incompetence. That's, that's a big fear of mine. Okay. So you sort of pick your people in a way. Yeah. In terms of, yeah. yeah. Um, is it usually easy for you to see many sides of an issue or do you tend to strongly identify with one point of view? No, it's very easy for me to see many sides. Mm -hmm. I think that's why it's hard for me to sometimes really be the justice person. In fact, that's that's one of the few words that turn me off. <laughs> but I also know that because I do stand for justice, but the word itself, like when I've seen other people use it, then they ah, seem okay. so righteous. And like, this is the right thing. And it's like, okay, get off of your high horse. But at the same time, there is a part of me there that's like, well, no, that is the right thing. But then it's also like, but I, I see why that other situation is going this way. So instead of going so hard in this area, let's try to approach it in a manner that's, you know, and it, like assuming that the other person does not mean ill intent kind of mm. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But yeah, at the and moment that someone is intentionally meaning illness, then it's like, okay, well, yeah. And what is your experience of anger? I, I, I view myself as a very rational person and anger is something that I only use when I feel like I have proper reason to and slash or when I've really been pushed to that limit. Mm -hmm. But it, it's really a last resort. And then after I get angry, then I'm, I'm more angry because the person pushed me to be angry in the first place, which is just very draining. I'd rather mm -hmm. just be kind or give hints uh, before I blow up at you. And then now all of a sudden you act right. Okay. Um, so yeah. um, do you experience it often? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. And Some things like will like irritate me, like, mm, but. Okay. But yeah, no, I don't, I don't like actually feel anger. Okay. How do you experience conflict? Um, I, I don't like it. Yeah, mm -hmm. I don't like conflict. I, I try to resolve it as soon as possible because I don't like the energy that's left there. I don't like that to just be kind of like left unresolved and weird vibes. Mm -hmm. But 
But if I if I see that something could lead to conflict, then I'm always going to try to look for an alternative route because. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah. It's like yeah. So like if if conflict ensues, then it's like ah, oh, okay, let's go and clean this up because I don't like this mess. But I will try to avoid any way for conflict to, like, for the mess to happen to begin with. That makes sense. And is harmony important to you? Absolutely. And how easy or difficult is it for you to say no? It is pretty difficult. Can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, if somebody requests something, I think because I, I always immediately think to myself, like sometimes I might think to myself, I don't feel like doing that. But mm -hmm. then I think about how important it might be for that person. And then I think about how I'm probably being selfish in a way. Um, and then it's like, no, yeah, I'll go ahead and do it. Or even if, uh, you know, it might cost me like sleep, maybe like, oh, you have mm -hmm. to wake up early to give this person a ride or something like that. It's like, once again, this might be important to that person. And on top of that, it's like, yeah, so you can get sleep anytime. Like you can nap mm -hmm. later. Yeah. So it's kind of like, I, I somehow more times than not find a way to uh, rationalize like, oh, the other person's needs are more important than my comfort in a way mm -hmm. do you tend to put others ahead of yourself I would definitely say so yeah and do you tend to forget yourself <laughs> yeah <laughs> um it's really interesting to watch other types answer that question. <laughs> um, how self-critical are you? I'm very critical of myself when it comes to my competence and how I treat people, mainly the latter. So when I'm incompetent, I'm mainly afraid of other people looking at me as stupid. Mm -hmm. But... I don't have a problem with them like educating me. I love being a student. Like yeah. I really have no problem looking as if I know nothing, as long as the person who is seeing me in that state is like, yeah, sure, Denzel, I'll help you. And they mean it like with sincerity. But if it seems like it's coming from a haughty place, I that's that's where I really, really dislike it. And I try to protect myself by even if I don't know something, I'm gonna just try to remain quiet and hope that they think that I know more than I actually do. Um, right, okay. Yeah, but when it comes to uh, uh, how I treat people, I think I take pride in that. Like I, I have very, very strong instinct on how people should be treating each other. And so when I hear that I've treated somebody wrongly without knowing, or something like that, then I, I get very critical of myself, like stupid, like you should know better. You're the one who's supposed to be setting an example. So <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's like uncomfortable for me. And like I said, I'll always own up to it, which is kind of the paradox of me like, all right, you redeem yourself by setting the example again. Um, because mm -hmm. somebody who just denies this would, is not the type of person that you wanna be. But if you accept what you've done wrong, and that's mature, that's responsible. Um, and I, I want to be a mature, responsible person in that manner. But I'm upset with myself for having to do that in the first place. Okay. It's, it's pretty embarrassing, yeah. Um, how critical or judgmental are you of others? I think, I'm, so I'm not critical of anyone's competence. Mm -hmm. But I am critical of other people, like how they treat other people until okay. I know if it's intentional or unintentional. So if it's unintentional, then I try to find a way to bring it to their attention. 
um, in a kind manner. And then if it's, um, and if it's intentional, then yeah, I'm very mm -hmm. critical of those people. And is that critical, um, does that, is inside your head or do you externalize that criticism? I think it depends on the situation. Okay. Sometimes I do externalize it. Actually, I'd say rare, nah, maybe rarely I externalize it. And even okay. then, I might like just go make a YouTube video about it instead of going <laughs> to okay. talk to that person. Yeah. Um, how important is it for you to be right? It's important for me to be right, as in, I, I want to always have the right answer. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to believe the wrong things. And so therefore, if somebody's giving me a right answer or saying that an answer that I have is wrong, then I immediately am like, oh, please then teach me the right answer so that I can have the right answer. But it's not important for me to be right in the sense that I have to keep on badgering my opinion until the other person submits instead i'm more of actually the person to just be like okay even if i think that the other person's wrong i just i, I don't feel like arguing so i'll just be like okay <laughs> okay and when you set about accomplishing a task do you sense there is one right way or best way to do it or many good ways i'm trying to think of a task I could use maybe as an example to think of. I want to say I usually just see one way, mm -hmm. but I don't think that I'm closed off to seeing like other ways right. necessarily. Yeah, like if other ways are presented, I'd probably be like, oh, okay. But I think that usually if I'm trying to self to accomplish a task, then I am like looking and fixated on like one way. Okay, darky. And would you describe yourself as perfectionistic? No. Nah. Would others describe you that way? I'm not sure. Okay. That's a good question. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it... so. Okay. Yeah. I don't think and so. what is your experience of rules? Oh, I don't really like them sometimes. <laughs> if I'm if I'm being honest. I, I know it's bad, but I often think of myself as exempt from rules. Okay. Like, I think that everybody else is supposed to follow them. But for me, what's important is knowing why the rule was put there so that I can just keep that from happening. But the rule itself is not really important. So mm -hmm. it's like, just as a mild example, if there's a stop sign, it's like, okay, well, the reason why there's a stop sign is so that you can stop and make sure that, you know, there's no cars coming in those intersections before you go. Now that I know, now that I know the reason why it's there, then I don't have to come to a complete stop every time. <laughs> yeah, so stuff like that, like you can expand it into other areas. But then I think that other people, I don't trust other people to have such a mind. Like, I think that they should stop. <laughs> <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Um, and some people lean towards feeling responsible or overly responsible. Others are more carefree. Which end of that spectrum do you fall on? I think I'm more responsible. Would you say you are generally the same person from situation to situation, or do you tend to adapt or alter how you present yourself to suit the different people you are with? I adapt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you I, give me an example? Yeah. Uh, one way that I think best describes it is I see interactions as like there's a beaker in the middle of me and the person or me and the group of people. And I have a whole library of different chemicals and depending on what they put into the beaker first, 
then mm-hmm. I decide which beaker I'm going to put in to make the concoction that I would like from okay. the interaction. Yeah. Okay. So I, I would you... all of the uh, chemical concoctions that I have are authentically myself. But mm-hmm. Yeah. I love that metaphor. Thank you. Um, do you ever, uh, do you tend to hedge or sugarcoat or even misrepresent your opinion to avoid displeasing someone? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I do. Okay. How easy is it for you to recognize or sense what other people need? I think it's pretty easy for me. Mm-hmm. Can you give me an example? Yeah, I think that I'm very attuned to when people either are not, like, I think I know people's baseline moods. Mm -hmm. And so I can, I know when they are lower than their baseline or higher than their baseline. Um, And usually when they're lower than their baseline, then I'm, I'm tuned into that. I'm tapped into that. And I can, yeah, I can kind of like figure out like, okay, well, why are they lower in this area right now? And if I don't know, then I can probe at them and Mm -hmm. in a gentle way to find out. Gentle probing. Yes. yes. (laughs) Um, How easy or difficult is it for you to know what you need? I'd say definitely in the past, it was very difficult. Okay. I'd say that I've, I've done a lot of work on it now. So usually now I, I, I can know what I need, mm-hmm. but the hard part is validating why I need it. Okay. Uh, if, if it's coming at the expense of anyone else. So it's and like, ha- okay, if I need sleep then but somebody else needs me to be awake to aid to them in some way then it's hard for me to be like okay well but I need sleep Mm -hmm. yeah it goes back to the whole oh well you can just sleep tomorrow instead but then it's like tomorrow another issue will come up and cycle repeats got it and so when you have a need and validated it is it easy for you to ask for it to be met no (laughs) I want everybody to do things just because they want to Mm -hmm. and so when I ask for it then I feel weird I feel very weird by that but then at the same time I do try to find ways to make it clear to the person that that's what I would like without Mm -hmm. directly asking them hey can you do this for me because I guess I feel like I'm putting pressure on them to do that and even if they do do it then it's 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 different now because I requested it from them how important is it for you to be liked by others I'd say it's very important Mm-hmm. If I if I feel like someone dislikes me, I'm I'm very curious to know why. I feel like I'm allowed to, kind of like the rule thing. I think I'm allowed to dislike people, but other people aren't allowed to dislike me, <laughs> unless if it's a valid reason. Then, yeah. <laughs> okay. And how important is pleasing others or gaining others' approval? Um. I want to please others, but Mm -hmm. I don't think I will, I don't think, I won't try that hard to please you unless if I really like you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that's not something I will really push myself to go out of my way to do at my own expense if I don't really enjoy you as a person or anything. How essential is helping people to you? It's very essential. But something that I've realized is that uh, 
I think in the past, I've always been the helper to friends of mine. Mm -hmm. like, and they, they like, that's kind of how I used to keep them around um, mm -hmm. by having them be like codependent on me. And eventually I got really tired of that because I realized the only, a, a lot, the only conversations that we were having was like 80% of the time I was helping them. And then 20% of the time we were being intimate and I didn't mm -hmm. like that. Um, I wanted, so when I started making friends who it was kind of like flipped, like 80% of the time we were being intimate, you know, sharing deep thoughts and opinions and just connecting on general things. And then uh, um, the 20% of the time when they need help, or maybe even a greater percentage, like when they need help, like every occasion, and it's like, yeah, I'm more than happy to help because I actually feel a deep connection with you. But mm. if I feel like all I'm there for you to is just to give you wise counsel and advice, I don't really feel like I'm your friend. So. Got it. Okay. And how do you feel if someone important to you doesn't accept your help or advice? It's annoying. Mm -hmm. Because. Yeah, it's very annoying because then I feel like I feel like I give really good advice. Like if I decided to give you advice and you didn't take it, then to me, I have to make myself not care at that point. Like, mm -hmm. all right, well, you know, whatever happens to you, that's your fault kind of thing. But then also, depending on what it is, then I, I'm worried about the person and it's like, dang, they could have avoided because I, I feel like I can see what's going to happen. And but they just won't, you know, listen. So then it's like, all right, well, there's nothing I can really do. Mm -hmm. And would you say your attention is focused more on yourself or more on other people? Definitely more on other people. How important are goals? No, I feel like probably not really that important. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Like, even with my YouTube channel, it's like I, I work, I feel like I'm a hard worker, but if I ever see myself like working too hard, <laughs> I feel like there's something in me that's like, ew. I don't know. <laughs> what are you doing? Yeah. And so it's like, oh, for my YouTube channel, it's like if I see myself like thinking too hard about, like, okay, so what video am I going to put out next week? Or how can I market it in this way? Then I'm like, oh, no. I just kind of want things to happen naturally. Okay. Yeah. Like, oh, I got 3K subscribers. Cool. Like, this didn't, that didn't have to do too much stuff to get there um yeah um would people who know you well describe you as an overachiever i don't think so okay and how important is image to you i'd say it's important it goes back to the people liking me thing i don't want people to like when i would work like as a server i, I didn't want people to view me as incompetent or as someone who wasn't a team player, especially like the weakest link kind of thing. Mm -hmm. like so, yeah. And I don't want people to view me as a mean person either or somebody who's immature and dishonest and stuff like that. I, I just don't want to be viewed as things that I, I don't really think that I am. And if I am any of those things and I try to change it, like I work on it. Okay. So are you conscious of creating an image so that people will see you a certain way? I might be at times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like I'm aware of how people might view me, but um, I don't know. I don't know if I would use the word consciously creating it. Okay. I think it's more of, I, I just try to show up as who I actually am. 
Mm-hmm. And then if I feel like people are not seeing who I actually am or they're misinterpreting it, then I'm trying to be like, no, let's let's straighten out what you're seeing versus what's actually there. Got it. And how important is it for you to be perceived as successful? I, well, I guess depending on what success means. Um, I think for me, it's more about not being seen as a failure or incompetent than it is being seen as successful. Mm -hmm. So, so it's more embarrassing if I can view, if I can see that people are maybe going to my channel and be like, huh, Denzel's only getting like four views on his videos or something like that or he got like three likes on this Instagram picture that's more embarrassing to me than you know me striving to like have like a million views and subscribers and like that's not really a goal that would be nice but it's not something that I feel like I want people to see Mm -hmm. yeah yeah I'm not really like shooting for that Got it. And what is the experience of failure like for you? Um, Well, I guess, so there's situations like if I lost in a game of basketball, like I remember when I used to play on a team, uh, I would be the probably like one of the only people on the team that would be like, wow, well, at least we had fun. And then my <laughs> teammates who were crying, like, shut up, Denzel. So they they didn't like that. But okay. so, yeah, so I, I, I was OK with like losing in those situations. But if I like failed, you know. I'm trying to think of something that would really bother me with failing. I'm also wondering, too, like maybe sometimes I just made myself like not care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And how important is it to be recognized for your achievements? Mm. I don't, I wouldn't like it if the credit went to someone else. Mm -hmm. That would piss me off. And then I need to be recognized for it. But I don't mind if it's being appreciated. And like, for example, if I'm, if I'm like anonymous, but it's, it's something like getting like high accolades of of some sort, then that's, that's fine for me to just know, like, if I'm the only one who knows like, oh, that's me. So that's cool. Okay. Yeah. To what degree are you in touch with your emotions? I want to say that it's, it's, it, especially growing up, it's been very difficult and it's something that I've been having to work on, but it's still hard. Um, I think I rationalize everything too. As soon as I feel an emotion, it has to make sense to me. So Mm -hmm. I like, for example, I can't just be angry, like, or even offended. I I heard a a quote that said being offended is a choice. And I really Mm -hmm. agree with that, at least when it comes to me. Like if somebody says something quote unquote offensive to me, before I'm offended, I have to like identify like, okay, wait, was their intention to actually offend me? If it was then I'm probably offended. But if it wasn't, then I'm not offended. Now, if it was, now I have to also ask myself like, okay, well, is it true? Because if they were saying something to me, but it was true, then there's no reason for me to be offended. It's like, no, Denzel, you were being a jerk or Denzel, you know, you were. And so I, yeah, like I have to think through stuff like that in that way. Um, Mm -hmm. But I'm also afraid, like it kind of goes back to the anger thing. Like I, I see people all the time, like, especially on TV and stuff. It's like, they'll blow up at their wife or something. And it's like, 
I'm sorry, babe. I didn't mean that. And I, that disgusts me. I'm like, how can you lose your, your cool so much that you mm-hmm. say things that you don't mean? And it's like, you know, maybe people feel things so much deeper than I do. That's why it's harder for them to, you know, not react. Whereas like for me, I'm not a very, I don't think to myself to be a very reactive person. If anything, I feel like mm-hmm. people probably get upset with me because I seem too non-reactive. Mm. And I'm just thinking about how to respond to everything in the most appropriate, responsible, mature manner. Got it. Okay, so over your lifetime, what has been your experience of sadness? People often view me as a very happy person. Mm -hmm. But yeah, when I'm sad, then I I get really, really sad. (laughs) And I I try not to let my sadness affect other people. So like I might like hide away with it. But yeah, like when when I'm sad, then I... uh, yeah yeah okay so do you feel sad frequently or infrequently well comparing to other people that I know I think that I feel I feel sad infrequently but I've also been thinking recently about how like people that I know like I'm like wow you're sad like every day like (laughs) and and it's like that it almost kind of irritates me if I'm being honest at times like like why are you always so sad (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then sometimes it's almost like even if I am sad I can't even I don't even have space to be sad because you're sad so it goes back to like the self-forgetting kind of thing and then it could maybe even look like to other people that, oh, Denzel's never sad. And it's like, well, yeah, no, sometimes I am, but you're just always sad. So <laughs> I'm not about to bring it up on you. Like, by the way, this happened to me. And then it's so much easier to think that whatever's happening with them is way more serious too. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah okay. than whatever's happening to me. That yeah. makes sense. So do you, how much do you compare yourself to others? I think I do a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I compare myself and how they, how they present themselves or how they dress or look, um, how they treat other people, how they especially handle emotions. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm always like, I'm always like assessing that. Mm-hmm. Like, Oh, that's interesting that they, decided to act in this way or respond in this way I think I would have responded more in this way I wonder what that says about them I wonder what that says about me kind of thing okay so what's the outcome of that mental comparison when you're comparing yourself to them sometimes I I think I do get like a if I'm being candid like a kind of like a self-righteousness kind of Mm -hmm. thing (laughs) this person doesn't know how to keep their cool like that's that's absurd um or wow like look how irrational this person is like they're not even like they just they just started yelling about whatever was going on before they even listened to the other person um but then there's other times like you know maybe like when it comes like physical appearance or whatever it's like like I think like at one time like one time I was at a party um and I don't usually go to parties so when I was there I was just kind of like more observing And there was a guy over there, like I was looking at everyone, I was observing everyone in like the social culture. And I noticed that there was one guy who pretty much all of the women were rushing to like dance with him. And it was like a very kind of like provocative kind of dancing. So I was like, okay, interesting. But then those same women, when other guys maybe like would try to dance with them, then they acted like disgusted. And I was like curious as to like where I would fall on the scale and how could I be more of the guy who could, if I wanted to like not be rejected, but rather like everybody would fawn over me kind of thing. And so it's like stuff like that. It's like, oh, like I wonder what he's doing differently than the other guys. And so stuff like that, I'd like compare and then I'd put myself in the mix. Like, so where am I here? And what could I have done to maybe you know, do that. 
So that's that's like a recent example. Okay, no, that's good. And is it easy for you to see what's missing in a given situation? I think so. Mm -hmm. You get any okay. example? I'm trying to figure out how to interpret that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I feel like it's easy for me to know like when what's missing is like, if somebody thinks that you're lying, like if I'm watching like a show, it's like sometimes I can think in my head like, okay, dude, if you just said this, then maybe he wouldn't think that you're lying anymore. Why didn't you mm -hmm. offer that information? Or if you just spoke in this tone, then maybe that would have changed things or, you know, yeah, stuff like that. Got it. How important is having alone time in your own space? I'd say it's pretty important. Mm -hmm. um, I need sometimes like I will pull myself away from everyone, like just periodically throughout the day, like into the bathroom, just to like literally just stand there for a moment and just like breathe mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yeah, just like have clarity of thought without feeling like anyone's around me or that I have to like aid to anyone or anybody can interrupt me at any moment. Mm -hmm. How central is it for you to pay attention to managing your time, space and energy level? It's pretty central. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What does it look I, like for you? I have to make sure uh, I try to I try to really watch my energy uh, mm -hmm. because especially like with people I try not to like spread myself too thin which I think because in the past I've had the opposite problem where I pour I put too much of myself and people and in relationships and all of that and then those investments did not um, give back in the way that I wanted them to and so now I'm a lot more careful with uh, the people that I invest in and how I invest in stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Do you have a tendency to hold back your feelings until you are alone? Until? You're alone. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I have to... I have to know a clear way on how the other person's going to respond. And I have to make sure that I'm actually in the right and that it's rational. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And would you say you're more of an observer or more of a participant in social situations? That one's honestly tough because I really mm -hmm. feel like I'm both. Okay. I, I'm really good. I'll say that. Okay. I'll put it this way. I don't think because I see people who would probably claim themselves to be observers and I feel like they wouldn't even have the ability to be able to participate, then I'd probably lean on the participating but I would say that I have both what they have and the ability to participate um, because mm -hmm. I think that a lot of people believe that because you're participating, you're not able to observe at the same time. But I really strongly believe that while I'm participating, I'm actually observing more than people would ever know. And Got sometimes it. I intentionally act as if I'm not observing things because I don't want to throw people off. It might make people feel like, oh, why is he watching me? I don't want people to know that I'm observing them. So I'll kind of act a certain way so that I can retain, I can get closer and get the information that I want without people knowing that, without interrupting the experiment in a way. Yeah. No, that makes sense. And okay, so what role does fear play in your life? Um, I'm very fearful of uh, people making me out to look dumb, <laughs> mm -hmm. like I said before. Uh, and oh yeah, I'm very fearful of 
upsetting other people and very fearful of like just losing friendships that I've invested in very deeply. So if I've if I've really grown to trust and love someone and then they I, I, I get fearful that people view me as boring eventually and then or they'll find some other shiny person and then they'll kind of like stop investing in me as much as I'd like for them to and that yeah that often like really brings me down so I'd say like that's where like my fear most centralizes like I'm always that goes back to the whole energy management thing like as soon as I enter a friendship then I'm like okay how long is this person going to be around how much should I invest and I'm just gauging all of that for the long term so that if they do leave then I was already prepared for it um, got it yeah now I'll turn on the light real quick okay um how do you relate to authority I don't mind it Mm -hmm. yeah as long as they know what they're doing and they're kind if if authority is not kind then I kind of want to be uh um uh insubordinate <laughs> mm -hmm. and are you slow to trust people or do you trust easily I'd say based off of my past, yeah, I trust easily. Okay. Yeah, it, it hasn't been until as I grew older that I started to be a lot slower on trusting them. Right, okay. And how much focus do you place on forecasting potential problems? A lot. Mm -hmm. Can mm. you tell me more about that? Yeah, I'm always kind of like what I said about the conflict thing mm -hmm. um and sharing my feelings it's like okay if I share this feeling that I had or if I shared this thought if I shared whatever if I said no to this request what's going to happen from that is okay. this something that I'm okay with happening what's going to happen after that is that something I'm okay with happening um how can I respond to this in this situation if I respond this way this might happen. Is that what I want? Is that the best thing that could happen? So I start just looking at all of the different ways that something might happen. And then I try to choose the one that's most favorable, even if it might be at my own expense, but yeah. Okay. So are you a good troubleshooter? I would say so, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> at least interpersonally. If you bring me like an electronic or something, I might not be able to troubleshoot what the problem is. Got it. Do you tend to doubt yourself? Yeah. Yeah, even if I'm pretty certain of an answer or an opinion of something, then if somebody, uh, if somebody presents their opinion to me, and they seem very certain about it, then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, am I wrong? And it, I'm pretty sure I'm right, but because of how certain they seem to be, then I'm easily starting to think that maybe I, I'm, I have my memory is not the best and all of this other stuff. How frequently does that happen? All the time. <laughs> I feel like there's very few times that I'm, I'm like very, like, no, this is it. It's like, wow, like right. this person won't back down. Maybe I'm really wrong. Or maybe we're both right. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And how do you experience limitations or restrictions? I don't like that. <laughs> yeah, I don't like yep. that at all. Yeah. I, I think I think especially in my favorite interpersonal dynamics, and it might sound again like weird, but are the ones that I feel like there's no boundaries there. Like mm -hmm. everything's on the table to be able to talk about and nobody's being judged. And you know, I like I like the idea of I'm allowed to do and you're allowed to do whatever 
even if we won't do it. So it's almost like when I turned 21, then um, I, I wasn't planning at the time to ever drink alcohol, but I just loved the idea that like, oh, you know, I get to, now I can drink alcohol. Um, and uh, now it's like, yeah. So like, I, I guess like that's, that's pretty much what it is. Like just like having the freedom to be able to go to the places, even if I'll never go there. So when I'm mm -hmm. restricted from that, then I don't like it. Okay. So is it typical for you to keep your options open? Depending on the situation, like I like to make decisions such as like if I'm going to buy my younger sister a gift and I go with my wife, then the first thing that I see that I think that my younger sister might really like, I'm ready to buy it. <laughs> okay. Whereas like my wife, like, let's go look at five, seven other things, even though we might still end up with the first thing. So then to me, it's like, well, that was kind of a waste of time, even though I know from <laughs> another vantage point, it wasn't a waste of time um, because we just made certain that there was something probably better over there. Um, but I do like to leave my options open as in like, Am I really making the best decision? But once I make the decision, then I believe that I, I like the quote that successful people don't make uh, the right, don't always make the right decisions, but instead they just make their decisions right. So I, I try to stand by that. Mm -hmm. Are you more of an optimist or more of a pessimist? I'd say definitely an optimist. Okay. Uh, could you Tell me a little more about that. Yeah, I think that I like to be happy. So, <laughs> so uh, if something bad is happening, then it's not like I'll ignore it. But if there's nothing that I can do about it, then I'm like, okay, well, this is happening, but let's just like, I, like being upset about it is not going to do anything. And if mm -hmm. I see, so like, you know, I guess like optimism versus pessimism, like pessimistic people, in my opinion, they're creative in the sense that any situation that comes to them, they can find a way It's like, yeah, well, you know, but I could have had 10 instead of eight or like, you know, stuff like that. But to me, like I'm the, I've been the type of person that like, I've kind of even been laughed at like, oh yeah, if I went to a game show and you could have potentially won like a million dollars and I'm walking away with 10,000, Hey, I still have ten thousand dollars. <laughs> um, so, yeah. So, do you tend to reframe negatives into positives? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. And is it hard for you to look at negative data or the darker side of things? No, it's not. I don't think it's hard for me, but I just don't like to look for too long mm -hmm. because if I see that it's gonna bring my mood down and there's nothing that I can do about it, then I don't see the point. Okay. And how important is making time for fun or pleasurable activities? It's pretty important. I, I like to, I like, I like the times when I'm able to just relax and, and just enjoy myself. And how much of a priority is this for you? I'd say it's, uh, I'm, a, I'm a work hard and then play hard kind of person. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that it, it's a priority that like, if I haven't had the time to be able to really just relax, it goes back also to like the alone time thing. Like if I haven't had the time to like escape to the bathroom for a little bit, even if it was only for like two, three minutes or something like that, then I start to feel some type, I, I guess I, like in my, in my head, I'm a little bit like grumpy. And so in the same sense, like I need to create that time where I can just relax and be affable and everything so that I can keep a, a genuinely happy disposition. Mm -hmm. And 
some people like to envision multiple possibilities. Others like to get in there and do the work. Which are you? Yeah, I like to, I like to try to get in there and do the work, but kind of like what I was saying earlier, like as soon as I feel like I've seen a possibility that will work. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I also kind of view myself, I don't view myself as lazy, lazy, but I also don't view myself as like incredibly hardworking. I, I, so it's like, I'm lazy in the sense that I don't want to do more work than I have to do, but the work that I do have to do, I will do it. So but if I can find a way that, yeah, that I can do the work without having to do extra work, then yeah, I like that. And when it comes to your general frame of mind and the way that you think, you think, do you tend to focus more on the past, the present or the future? I'd say the future. Yeah, I'm often running simulations of how's this going to happen? How can I make this happen? Okay, if that happened, then what's going to happen over here? And then how can I influence that? And then if I get caught influencing that, then what should I do over here? If I don't get caught, then what, then what happens over here? So my mind is always doing stuff like that. Okay. Um, right. Do you feel delighted or uncomfortable when you're receiving a compliment? I feel delighted. Mm-hmm. It's nice. Do you focus on helping a select group of people or on helping most people? I'd say most people. Mm-hmm. And when someone refuses your help, are you more likely to get resentful or to forget about it? Forget about it. Do you embrace or avoid routines? I avoid them. Yeah, I get bored. <laughs> mm-hmm. Do you find it easy or hard to talk about yourself? Um, I think in the past I found it harder. And now I found it easier, especially because it, it produces intimacy which is Uh what I mainly want. So it's like, okay, the more that I can, so whenever I do go exploring my inner self, then it's for the sake of, oh, I'll get to share this with someone that I find worthy sharing it with. That makes sense. Is it more central for you to have multiple options or to forget yourself? Is it more feasible, you said? Central, is it more central? central? me to have multiple options or to forget myself oh i don't even see the correlation there um well i don't like having multiple options i'll say okay. that <laughs> yeah well that answers but, that question then yeah <laughs> and then Are you more focused on being aligned with people or on fulfilling your own desires? Oh, being aligned with people. (laughs) And which is more common for you, being distracted by boring tasks or being extra focused when a task will be seen by others? Being extra focused when a task will be seen by others. Mm -hmm. And... Which is more central to you, needing multiple options or being resentful when someone refuses your help? Um, I think, I think uh, the multiple options probably. Mm-hmm. Okay. All right. Oh, that's all right. That's it. We're ready. Oh, no. No, I forgot something. Damn it. I'm always it's forgetting so things. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I'm good to go. No, I'm not. There's several steps I haven't thought about yet. Okay. Let's just do those <laughs> steps. I skipped this step earlier today, so I better do it now. <laughs> okay. 
Okay. All right. So I'm now going to read you a set of statements. And I want you to tell me what, which of these statements, and we're going to do this twice, which of these statements is most like you? Okay. So here are the first set. When it comes to working with others, I'm most comfortable, option one, doing things I like by adhering to routines I'm used to, plus balancing alone time with teamwork. Option two, when it comes to working with others, I'm most comfortable being an integral part of a team effort, even if it takes a lot of work on my part and I don't get the credit. And option three, when it comes to working with others, I'm most comfortable working with someone I like, though I have trouble identifying and pursuing my own priorities. Mm. Can you read option number one one more time? Of course. Uh, when it comes to working with others, I'm most comfortable doing things I like by adhering to routines I'm used to, plus balancing alone time with teamwork. Wow, all three of these. It's like, I don't like the routines that much, but balancing alone time and teamwork, that's cool. But then also the third one, especially, it's like, if I really like somebody, then I can really cling to wow. them. Yeah, without even uh, caring about what I really have to do. Because at that point, my goal is to just be closer to that person. So that's pretty much what I have to do. Um, in my so it head. sounds like all three of them resonate in some way. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, so let's do it for a different set now. Okay. Okay, so this set, when it comes to connecting with people, option one, I want to be liked. So I try to be the kind of person people like, friendly, fun, and charming. Option two, when it comes to connecting with people, I want to be influential. So I work hard doing important things and support others in significant ways. Option three, when it comes to connecting with people, I focus on attracting a specific individual through showing how attractive and exciting I am to be with. Mm. I'd say option one. Option one, okay. Okay. Um, so what I would normally do now is compare the top one from the first set with the top one from the second set. Because we haven't chosen a top one from the first set, um, mm. what I might do is... I'll just do this. I'm going to, I'll pick one for you and then we'll see how we go. Sure. Um, okay. So of these two statements, let me know which one sounds more like you. When it comes to working with others, I'm most comfortable being an integral part of a team effort, even if it takes a lot of work on my part and I don't get the credit versus option two, when it comes to connecting with people, I want to be liked. So I try to be the kind of person people like friendly, fun, and charming. I think I think option two, the one that you just read, mm -hmm. I feel like I'd prefer that one. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so as you might have expected, um, the types that stood out the most were nine, two, and seven. Uh, and then in the differentiation stage I ruled out type seven and so then okay. I was comparing two and nine in that subtype statement section so I was doing them mm. um so the the subtype that you chose in terms of the statement sounded most like you was self-preservation two oh, um, <laughs> mm -hmm. um and so if I just go back to the two, there were some things about two that, uh, let's see, what did we say for two? Um, talked about adapting, seeing people's moods. Sorry, this is where I have to read my own handwriting and that's the tricky oh, no, part. no problem. Uh, the easy part. That's how I am doing profiling sessions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like, what have I written here? What was the answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. So for two, when we talked about adapting, um, you talked about the chemical compounds mm -hmm. and, that, and that sort of piece there. You did say mm -hmm. that you do sugarcoat a little bit. Um, and so that, 
is a sort of a, that's definitely more leaning towards a two answer. Um, when you said how easy is it for you to recognize or sense what other people or need, you talked more about their mood. A two might talk about things beyond their mood. They could sort of sense a wider range of things. Um, mm. So for you said you can sense when it's lower and so you probe to figuring out what's going on. Right, right. From what I, for the twos I've spoken to, it's a little bit easier to go, I can see what they need without asking them type thing. Oh, got you. Um, yeah. So I, I'm literally just, this is just a comparison to what other twos have said. I'm not saying you're not mm -hmm. a two, I'm just giving some information. Mm -hmm. um, when you said your, I asked you how difficult it was to know what you need. You said in the past it was difficult. You're working on that now. Um, and when you know what you need, the hardest part is validating why you need it. Twos mm. tend not to know what they need. Um, it takes them a long time to really figure out what they're feeling and what they need. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, so that was, and it was hard to speak up for it. So that's, I mean, two would say it's hard to ask for it, but two would also say it's very difficult to know what they need generally. Um, so the fact that you've been able to work on that, and I, how old are you? I'm assuming you're not. 27. Yeah. So I think a two wouldn't have yet been able to work on that. Mm -hmm. If you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, and then what does this say? I've circled it. It was obviously important. Oh, I want people to do things because I want, I don't want them to feel like they have to do it. This is oh, such yeah. a nine answer. Um, mm -hmm. They do, twos tend to get angry or resentful when people don't take their help or advice. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that was on the next page. So that was one thing um, you said, I heard some of that, but not mm -hmm. as, I didn't hear it as strongly as I might've heard it with the two potentially. Mm -hmm. um, This was a more of a two answer when we talked about approval. You said, you, I want to please others, but I want to try, I don't want to try that hard unless I really like you. And twos are very selective. They focus on helping just a very select group of people. Although later on oh. when I asked you if you help select groups or, or are more democratic, you said, I'll help anyone. That's more of a nine answer. Twos figure out who's important to them and they just want to help those people. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, that's one of the differentiators for twos and nines. Yeah, yeah, that is very interesting then. Because, yeah, I, I'm i very big on, like, yeah, like, just helping everyone. Um, but I think that, uh, yeah, the the liking thing is, like, I don't, I don't want to work hard to get people to like me. Yeah. So that's, yeah, that's pretty much, like, what I remember, like, what I was trying to say like right. oh no I, I generally I, I mean I feel like who doesn't want everyone to like them but I don't want to work hard for it I guess it's kind of like the, it's kind of like the subscriber thing like oh if I make it up to a million subscribers that'd be nice but as soon as I see myself like really working hard for them, I'm like oh no I don't I don't want to do that um mm. just want I think that's with me. yeah I think that's your three shadow mm. You have to work mm. on making peace with that at some point. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that, that. <laughs> yeah, I could definitely see that. <laughs> um, yeah, I so if you that. ask it to um, about, how, do you know how to make people like you? You'll get quite a list of, of things. And most people can say, well, I'm nice to someone. I know this and not, you know, so you get similar answers from nines and twos about that. It's just, um sort of sensing the attachment to it um mm. so some what i'm finding when i'm typing pe typing people is i'm not necessarily listening to the answer although some answers make it clear than others i'm listening to the rigidity or the attachment to the concept mm. behind it um mm. Mm. Uh, yes so that was the stuff i heard for two um I, I can go through the nine things if you'd like me to but yeah the two and the nine were both strong Okay. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. And I also didn't, uh, I think, so that's something I really need to clarify too, as in like understand for myself, because 
I think I always was under impression that twos know what they want, but they it's just hard for them to say it. Whereas no. like nine, they often don't know what they want like at all. Like I think that's what I had like heard. So yeah, that that's that's actually news to me then. Yeah, and that's one of the differences that, between it. Beatrice her. said that herself in the Enneagram roadmap. So now I'm, I'm a little bit confused with that. Like she said that um, twos, it's like they would know at times like what they want. And because they're working to get the person to like them. So like, it's like, okay, I know what I want. So I'm going to do this for you so that if you scratch my back, then I kind of want you to scratch. I mean, if I scratch your back, then I kind of want you to scratch my back kind of thing. Um, whereas like a nine doesn't even know what they want. Right. Um, it's that uh, the social too is more strategic. So mm-hmm. that they, they're more giving to get. Um, okay. than potentially the other twos. But yeah, so the um, question for the two, um, saying it's hard for them to know what they need and it's almost impossible for them to ask for what they need. Um, mm. So, and yeah, and one of the differences between the social seven and the two is the social sevens know what they need a bit more easily. Um, okay. Even if okay. they won't ask for it, they know what they need, but the two won't know what they need as much. Oh, without spending a lot okay. of time to ask for it so yeah so it's, these are some of the nuances mm-hmm. between that's the subtypes yeah yeah that's really good to know okay um, so yeah yeah well okay cool and yeah you can if you if you want like or if it's not a problem then yeah i'd be interested in the nine part as well okay um so you said see very like you see many sides easily so that's a, a nine answer um mm. you said i think the anger question anger so essentially you said sort of anger was quite rare for you um mm. and you need a proper reason to be pushed through. and what was really interesting is you said you get angry that someone made you angry you're angry that you had to be angry that was yeah. a really interesting answer I haven't heard before because um, you might hear a nine say, I felt relief that I got to be angry, but then I felt mm. guilty about expressing the anger. Mm. So getting all that mm. out feels relieving. And the next is like, oh, I feel bad. I might have, you know, hurt something. Or hurt yeah. Something. And so yeah. I sort of interpreted that to be a, to not be relief, but to be a little like that. Yeah, it was was pretty much the same thing. Yeah, like one of the examples that came to my mind was somebody who was agitating me at work for weeks. And I kept on like throwing hints at them, like with the face, like stop. And finally, it was one day where they really just disrespected me and I just popped off. And it spread through the whole, uh, like all of the employees so rapidly, like, Denzel blew up a David, Denzel blew up a David kind of thing. And for the next like 15 minutes, like after I had really uh, come at the guy, mm. then my heart was like beating and I had to walk away from the situation. Yeah. And I felt, re- I did feel relief. Like I was happy that like, yeah, I finally showed him like who's boss. But because my heart was beating so much from the conflict and it just, I'm just not used to being in that state of mind. Then I was angry at the fact that he made me that angry. And I was like, why did he have to push me this far? (laughs) Because after that, he never bothered me again. And I was like, and that made me upset. Like, why did I have to to do this for you to, yeah. Even thinking about it, it's like, it just doesn't make sense. But (laughs) yeah, I was, I was relieved because I like, that's kind of how I am. It's like, I'll think to myself stuff like, all right, this person has one more time and then I'll show them (laughs) Mm. (laughs) like this, this anger, this wrath. But then it's also like a strategic move because it's like, I am really angry, but I'm like, it's like the anger, like, again, like I said, is like the last weapon that's like, Mm. I don't want to use this, but I know that it's going to be so, it's going to catch you so off guard that it's like, all right by the time that I do use it, you deserved it. But at the same yeah. time, why did I have to use it? Because it's such a heavy sword. 
yeah yeah thank you for taking time to watch that video if you watched it whether it be on regular speed or two times speed i appreciate it and if you don't mind hitting that like button for me it really helps this humble channel out also if you haven't already subscribed and you like the content that i make then be sure to subscribe and hit that bell button that way you'll be able to keep in touch with all the new posts that i make and then also be sure to check out my playlist where you'll be able to find a lot of my older videos because i think that a lot of those have some great quality content too but anyway thanks again for watching make sure to leave comments questions book me for coaching sessions at denzelmensa.com and god bless